Okay, so Howard, welcome back again for round two of our conversation. I know last time you we talked, you said you're going away and stuff, and uh, did you go away somewhere special for vacation or? Yes, we went on a cruise in the Caribbean. It was wonderful. Oh, awesome! Yeah, yeah. The Caribbean is a special place. We go to Mexico once a year or something like that. Where, where in Mexico do you go? Um, it, we just started doing this in the last few years. Like we used to go to India when we had vacation, but my mother passed away and. There's family reasons and stuff. We stopped <laughs> doing that. So since then, we take our vacations going to Mexico and Cancun, and yeah. uh, Playa del Carmen, which is a town north of there, which is a you know like a cute little town. So those are our favorite places to go now. Yeah, and good. The Caribbean Sea is beautiful. Yes. So anyway, so last time that we left off, so um, let me check my. So last time that we left off, we discussed many important things, and I don't know if I told you I made this into an audio file and posted it on YouTube um, and I titled it by saying my conversation with Howard Storm. That's all it said, part one. Uh, there was no mention of ND or anything uh, like that and I didn't, you know, I just put it up and then I didn't know what to expect. Now one month later we have racked up something like 2,000 views um, just based on your name. So it looks like, you know, people are familiar with your name and they're digging this stuff. They're eager to know what you have to say. So I guess our time is not wasted or it's well spent, you know, making these interviews and, and putting it up there. People are thirsty to know the truth, including myself. So that's why we are having this conversation. So anyway, so, um, so last time we discussed some important things and we didn't get to dig into this stuff. So we are still, so I was asking, so before we get started with the book of Genesis and those things again, let me ask you one question. So um, you did mention in your NDEs elsewhere that when you, um, when you were on the other side, you were shown a lot of things as though, you know, there was a video or something playing, playback that you could see places, events, all this sort of thing. So when you when I asked you questions about creation and the origin of mankind, races, and all this stuff, are you speaking from your knowledge that you gained on the other side, you know, from memory of seeing something, or is this just opinion that you somehow developed after coming here? Jesus, I asked Jesus if um, science and the Bible were different. And he said, no, there is no conflict between science and the Bible. They're just two different ways of understanding the same thing. And I have understood that to mean that there is no conflict between science and the Bible. I take what Jesus says seriously. <laughs> um, so I'm not a flat earther, and I'm not a um, young earth person, and uh, so when I read the Bible, I try to understand what it means, because the Bible is truth, and then I try and uh, reconcile that with what I understand science is teaching us. And it's interesting that if you take the Bible seriously, and don't approach the Bible with ignorance and bigotry, they are quite reconcilable. For example, in the Hebrew, it says that in the first period of time, God created this. In the second period of time, God created this. In the third period of time, God created that. That's what the Hebrew says. The um, people who translated the King James had a poor understanding of Hebrew and Greek, and they translated it as the Hebrew word as day, and now people want to insist that the Bible said it was a 24-hour day, right. um, which is not a proper translation of the Bible. And I have checked this with the um, it's um, completely compatible with a, with a scientific understanding. Matter of fact, it's um, 
quite miraculous because the gener the Genesis account was written um, uh, sometime between three and four thousand years ago. Nobody knows exactly what the origin of it, but and and it's so compatible with science more than 3,000 years later when you read the creation stories of other religions they're um, they make no sense in relationship to science mm -hmm. you know because like if you look at like other creation stories and I'm just gonna make one up because I don't want to attack other people's religions you know they talk about the big turtle came down and swallowed the snake and the snake gave birth to right. you know the right. corn lady who you know, whose head fell off and two boys emerged out of her ears. And, yeah. you know, I mean, the, the, the Genesis story is truth. And there is no um, problem between understanding that scientifically. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, talking about mythology and other stories and so I was remembering, you know, talking about going to Mexico when we were there, they were talking about the, the story of the Mayans and they used to think that everything came from corn. <laughs> and, yeah. then, and then there was an the underground god and there's this god and then they played football under the ground and all this nonsense, you know. As soon as you hear this, you know that this is not true. But, you know, but again, the book of Genesis, although it seems to be pretty good as a teenager, you know, I had given it an examination. My grandmother was religious and I was, you know, scientifically oriented and so on. I just gave it a quick read and I, I was dissatisfied with the content in there. I didn't think this was very scientific at all. And to this day, although I, have, I think it is more scientific than I once thought, and that was that is with a lot of help from people like Hugh Ross, who is an astronomer who runs a ministry called Reasons to Believe. And yeah, he, that's a good he, sign. He, yeah, good sign. And he tries really hard to reconcile these events, and it requires a lot of gymnastics to make a good, you know, somewhat good sense out of it. But, but a plain reading of it does not strike me as scientific at all. For example, it just starts out by saying, you know, God created the heaven and earth. That's a good statement. Then it says the earth was formless and void. Then God cre God separated the waters above from the waters below. As a teenager, when I read it, I thought, well, I think this person who wrote it thinks that there is water in the blue sky above, just like there's water in the ocean below. <laughs> How dumb of them to think that there's water above the sky, you know, things like that. And then, you know, it goes on to say the fourth day. God created the lights in the sky to rule the seasons and the days, mark the night and from the day and all this stuff. Now, you know, now we know that that is, it couldn't have been like that because we know that sun is what holds all the planets in course. So sun right. was there long before the planets were there. Otherwise, you know, everything would just fly off into space, right? So I'm sure the old people didn't know. I mean, whoever wrote all these things didn't know. So when you... But if you... Yes. So it, yeah, it, but it if you... Is, if, yeah, yeah, go on, yeah. If, if you... You know, the first statement is God created the heavens and the earth. So that would imply God created everything, right? If it says God created every, let me put it, rephrase it, God created everything. Yeah. That so that's when we get to the next statement about the lights in the sky, mm -hmm. now God is creating um, the signs and the uh, movements that we now live by. It does, you know, there's another way of understanding. I mean, there's other ways to understand. Like you said, it may be uh, gymnastics, but if you um, take everything literally, it leads to confusion. But if you al allow it to speak to you spiritually and poetically, it does make sense. Yes, I can understand it from, uh, if you come with a religious viewpoint, it would make sense. But this is far from being scientifically rigorous no, enough. It's not, the, the Bible's not, I agree with you, the Bible is not science. There's not, the science as we know it didn't exist yes. 3,000 years ago. It didn't exist, matter of fact, it, science as we know it didn't exist 200 years ago. Um, if you look at um, science of like, even a hundred years ago, like let me give you an example because um, I think illustrates this very well. My deceased father-in-law was a professor of geology at the University of Iowa and he got his doctorate at Harvard University mm -hmm. on a GI Bill grant after World War II. He was a captain in the United States Army and served in 
the army during World War II and then went to Harvard and got his bill. Highly educated man, uh, professor all of his life. And when he heard about the idea of plate tectonics, he thought it was the stupidest idea he'd ever heard. Right. And all of his colleagues thought it was absolute nonsense that the, the crust of the earth was not moving around and shifting and the contents weren't, continents weren't drifting around and stuff like that. Yeah. And then um, in his scientific mind, it took, I think, something like two decades for him to become convinced that, like, oh, everything we knew and believe, believed, in fact, he was a geomorphologist, which means his uh, specialty was the movement of the earth. Um, everything that he wouldn't believe was proven to be wrong, right. taught at Harvard University, right. and he had a whole new uh, worldview that plate tectonics was real. So the point is, is that as science re-evaluates, readjusts, and changes its thinking every few years, and um, what little I know about science is it's so different than what I learned when I was a young man and when I went to college than it is today because I'm now an old man. That yes, sure. I have to, you know, when I, when I read science, I go, well, that's what people think now and, uh, and I'm open to the changes that are going to take place. It's to say the, the Bible is a book of wisdom and is not a book about science. Yes. And so it's like if I, if I were to... Um, evaluate it scientifically, I'm not looking for what the truth well, the, is. Right. I mean, the intent here, people are not looking up to the Bible as a scientific textbook. The intent is people are interested in what is in the Bible, and especially nowadays, it actually is somewhat costly to take the Bible seriously. Even in America, it is, you know, there's yeah. subtle forms of persecution to serious Bible believers. So it's not yeah. even an academic. People would like to believe this stuff, but they would like to have some, you know, reason and confidence in all these things that they, are, that they take on as beliefs because it's not without cost. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they look at the story and, you know, and they give it to read and then they're like, hmm, what does the secular science tell us about all this? How old is the earth? I've, you know, I sat in like lunches with some of my friends from work and stuff. Instantly, if it came up, somebody would be immediate, immediately, they'll throw this thing saying, you know, oh, the Bible says earth is 6,000 years old, must be true, <laughs> laughter, you know, that kind of thing. So, so it's not, the intent is not to read it as science, but nevertheless, it is making, it is telling a story of creation and with some numbers and dates and things, you know, it's debatable in there, along with other details like the sun and the moon, the day and night, the evening and morning. Then, you know, mankind was created from the dust of the ground. Adam was created from the side, uh, Eve was created from Adam's side in the rib and all this stuff. When you read all this stuff, you know, I don't know that a modern person, even legal, even not even a scientist, just any ordinary person with a common, uh, or, a common knowledge about science and uh, science in general would not find this to be a satisfactory story altogether of creation. I don't know if you feel the same way. What is the general sentiment among people about the book of Genesis? I think even Christians are largely embarrassed by it more than they have confidence in it. Yeah, but the... It, I I understand because um, our um, small minority of Christians are fundamentalists. Only a, of the two and a half billion Christians in the world, only a very small minority are fundamentalists. But they seem in the popular imagination to represent what Christians believe. And this is exactly comparable to saying all Muslims are mm -hmm. uh, like yeah. ISIS, yeah, like right. you know, they're, they're all Muslims are terrorists. And I resent that yeah. very strongly. Yes. Now, uh, yes, agree, agree. So the, the ones that are not fundamentalists, they are all over the place. And they are the ones that I'm referring to, which includes myself. That I would yeah. like to take these Genesis stories and so on seriously, yet I can't, and I have a little bit of confidence, and I don't know if I'll bring this up with my colleagues at work <laughs> in order to uh, gain ridicule, uh, but, you know, after reading Euros and so on, you know, I can, I did mention it, you know, when they were saying about 6,000 years, ha, 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 yeah. I, I did at least point out that the Bible doesn't necessarily say that, you know, yeah. so, 
anyway so that was so okay so the gist is there is a creation story in the bible it is not meant to be scientific uh, but even the non-scientific details uh, are we supposed to take it seriously or it's up to the individual what is your sense about it again you can comment on whether you, this is something you learned from Jesus and the angels or is this your opinion as to what one should do with these Old Testament stories about creation in the book of Genesis well, yeah. for, for example when I go to the um, uh, creation of human beings you know one of the interesting things about the Bible is is that although it doesn't mention them at first um, Adam and Eve have two sons and Mary um, women that already exist they marry contemporary women yeah right um so that kind of begs the question where did the women come from if adam and eve uh married mm -hmm. the two women yeah so what i, yeah. I mean that, that's what right. I, that well let me right. finish so yeah, you're right. yeah. but i so what my point is is that um there are omissions in the creation stories and we have to um you know, if we take take the literature somewhat seriously, we go, well, okay, there were other people besides Adam and Eve and their two boys because that, cause the boys married women, contemporary women, you know, which, which were not the product of Adam and Eve. They did not marry their sisters. They may have, so, though, because Adam and Eve supposedly lived wait, a long wait, time. It's still going on. You're not done. Hmm? Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, continue. So yeah. I see Adam and Eve as God selecting and lifting up two homo sapiens into a higher state of consciousness. When they lived in innocence, they lived like the animals without a higher consciousness. And so that I see the Adam and Eve story as God literally messing with the DNA of the species of human that God had developed over millions of years and that God gave them the ability to um, do things that our friends in the animal kingdom cannot do, like reason, conceptualize, um, imagine, uh, be creative, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, most of all, to know that they know, which is self-consciousness, not just, con you know, animals are conscious, but we have a new um, kind of consciousness, a self-consciousness. We, we know that we know. Um, we call it um, thinking, but that animals think, but they don't know what they're thinking. They can't conceptualize. Hmm. So that's what I see the Adam and Eve story really about. The problem with consciousness is they lose their innocence. You know, sin means to intentionally go against God. That's what sin literally means, to go against God. You have, you, sin is not ignorance. Sin yeah. is not being in the blissful state of an ignorance. Sin is like opposing God consciously, intentionally. So what Adam and Eve did with their consciousness, they go, hey, we don't have to, um, you know, uh, do what God tells us to do. We can do whatever we want to do. And so the... So the first thing that Adam and Eve uh, choose to, to do is disobedience, and the second thing they do is that they choose to hide from God, and then they feel shame, and um, you know, and that and that it's been the human condition ever since. Hmm. So you're saying you're saying that there were creatures that resembled human beings, which also, you know, the natural history of the world tells us as such that there was Homo sapiens and Neanderthals and oh, I, this all comes to, I actually learned a little bit about this from the Heroes Ministry. And 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 interesting info, interesting about this is that the Homo, uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, based on mitochondrial DNA that we can collect even from early specimens, you can't collect normal DNA, but you can collect mitochondrial DNA because there's 500 yeah. copies in the cell. Based on that, now we they have shown, and this is a consensus among uh, people who study these things, that they did not evolve into human beings. So whatever became human beings, there are no transitional fossils or anything available as to right. how, th how this happened. So it is a remarkable thing in itself in secular, secular science that human beings seems to be freshly created just somewhere in the last 100,000 years or so. 
um, uh, with no evolutionary history. But yeah. you're saying that, yeah, and, and so you're saying that, that, well, that may have happened through a process of God suddenly making, you know, throwing his hands and making a change to, uh, to the species that resemble yeah. human being, make it a human species, give them higher consciousness and elevate them to the level of a human being. Yeah, I believe in intelligent design. In intelligent design, um, we believe that God does these little, uh, you might call them tweaks, little adjustments, um, you know, and think things happen. The, the whole history of the planet is miraculous because um, this, when this planet first came into being, it was utterly uninhabitable by any life form. And um, all these amazing process of like, for example, these uh, one cell creatures um, breathing in carbon dioxide and expelling oxygen created um, planet. One of the great interesting mysteries of the evolution of the planet is where did the water come from? Because there was no water. There was no water on this planet. This place was a boiling mass of, um, you know, molten rock yeah. and there was no water. And then water was introduced to this planet. And so one of the theories is it came from comets. You know, like we, all these com comets bombarded the planet and com comets are, uh, you know, f mostly frozen balls of uh, ice. Yep. And that's where the water came from. But anyways, yep. God, God, when you look at it, um, it's interesting. All these factors come into being to uh, bring about life and then ultimately to bring about life that can um, glorify God. Yeah, I mean, Us. I mean, when, at least when I look at the world, there's no doubt that there's a super mind has worked on these things. And even atheist physicists, the heroes quotes a few of them, like a paper that was published. These physicists, you know, they're all atheists. Uh, they're looking at, they published a paper some 10 years or so ago. At that time, this dark energy was being discovered in the universe. Right. Now, the right. T title of the paper was that it, disturbing implications of a, <laughs> a cosmological constant, which is another term for dark energy. Yeah. You're saying that just by looking at the numbers and the accuracy with which, you know, it's like universes, if you imagine, it's like a balloon being blown up fr fr from its infancy. So if you blow up that balloon too fast, then the, it would just like, you know, t like taking a blower and leaf blower and uh, putting it into the garage, everything would just fly off wherever it wants to. On, right. the other, on the other hand, if you blow it up too slowly, then it would lump up too close together, like putting water into cornmeal or something like that. It would lump up into neutron stars and so on and then collapse in itself. We won't yeah. get a universe that is at the right level of density that we can have carbon chemistry and all these beautiful things that we experience. So yeah. they're just looking at it and then making that statement. This design is everywhere. Now, just, you know, pure physicists can admit it. Biologists can admit it. You know, ordinary people can intuitively admit it. This is everywhere. There's no doubt when I look at the world, tremendous amount of stuff has happened to make life possible, which is all good. Um, that agrees with the story of creation. Okay, so now let me, maybe we can sh shift gears. You brought up the question of sin. This was another thing that I was going to bring up, which is another important thing also embedded in the first few chapters of Genesis. One is creation, which, you know, like we discussed it, uh, you know, s has some few skirmishes with uh, contemporary science, but for the most part, you know, a thinking person can go away somewhat satisfied thing. Well, the outline of the story is correct. It's not meant to be a scientific document by any means. But, no. uh, okay. Now, the second thing that is in there is the question, the story of Adam and Eve we discussed marriage last time, which is another controversial thing. And then there's the third thing, which is sin. Now, uh, jump into sin. So supposedly, Adam and Eve were planted in this garden, and then uh, God, uh, there was a tree in which from which they were not supposed to eat. And then the serpent, believe it or not, came and spoke to Eve and said, well, you can actually eat, you will not die, and all this stuff. And then this is the origin of sin. Now, what is this story all about? Doesn't sound, this is like I was telling you about the Mexican story about the brothers who played football under the ground. This sounds similar to that one. What do you make of this story? Well, I, I did address it already that I think that it has to do with um, consciousness and when we, and when God created us to be conscious beings, self-conscious beings with a thinking mind, that gave us choice. And that my experience of life has been that every moment of my life is an opportunity to make choices. Now, um, as it was said 2,000 years ago, 
uh, by Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. Right. In other words, we were created to be aware, aware uh, not just aware of our environment, but aware of the consequences of the choices that we make. Right. And so every minute of every day, we have the opportunity to make uh, different degrees of good and different degrees of bad choices. Adam and Eve, the original humans, which interestingly enough, people that do DNA research say that we all came from the same mother and father. Every human being on this earth comes from the very same mother and father, which is interesting, yes. as that quote says from the Bible. So um, since that time, we, we have had the freedom to make choices, and there have been people in this world that have uh, been examples of people that made a lot of good choices. And so we've called them, um, you know, uh, great teachers, saints, prophets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And then we have examples of people in the world who've uh, just consistently made all kinds of uh, terrible choices. And I, um, I'm old now, and I look back at all the bad choices I made, and I look at the few good choices that I made, and uh, I'm really. I'm really trying to um, improve my batting average, if you will. Uh, <laughs> you know, with, with, given every situation um, that I deal with, I am trying to make the, the better choice. I am trying to be a loving, kind, compassionate, caring human being. Mm -hmm. And frankly, um, I, I'm doing better. I'm do I, I am do the improvement is slow and painful, but I am doing better. And... Um, I think that's why I've been given this life experience is to learn how to make uh, the right kind of choices. Mm -hmm. And I definitely, uh, definitely try and avoid choices that are in opposition to God's will as God's will has been revealed to me by Jesus Christ. Mm. Jesus good. Christ is my standard and my only standard of what God is and what God expects of me. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically you're saying that sin, it, came not not so much about that story about eating the fruit but it was uh, yeah, an act of violation an act of willful violation of God's intentions for these initial human beings and the first to first cup you know first human beings that God created were given a conscience enough enough for them to know the difference between right and wrong and they yes. they decided to <laughs> test out what's so wrong about wrong anyway to kind of attitude right yeah. yes um, okay this is a deep insight that you're you know describing this is not what many people i mean you you realize that you talked about the two billion christians that most of them do not have this insight right do you, do you agree that most people do not know this particular point that that's actually what happened um, I, I, I don't know what most people think. I'm a pastor, and, and the reason why I became a pastor is because I want to uh, educate um, the, as much as I possibly can. You know, um, you know, most people are pretty indifferent to the Bible. That's my, my experience is people, most people just don't even care. Yeah, I've sadly noticed this too. And increasingly in the culture that we live in, people are like that. Um, and I, it, it it actually and I, you know and it is it is easier for you to go along with that flow than to actually you know ask these sort of difficult questions. I notice that people get very uncomfortable when it, the instant something about philosophy, something of a religious nature comes into the discussion, people get immediately uncomfortable. That shows that they don't uh, entertain these questions and they decide to live life as though whatever the hell happens, it'll happen and we, we just right now let's have a good time, you know, I think yeah. that seems yeah. to be the prevailing attitude. Um, okay, so that's a that's a good insight into sin um, and I, again, you know, I don't know if this is something that you learned from the other side or is it something that you pieced together your own, because it's a very important question, the question of no, sin. Jesus yeah. explained to me that, um, I mean, this whole, this whole uh, thing that I talked about choices, that was from Jesus, he was telling me, and, you know, he doesn't expect us, I mean, this is from Jesus, he doesn't expect us to make the perfect choice every minute. If we made the perfect choice every minute, we would be Jesus, because he... He was without sin. He he never made the bad choice. He always made the perfect choice. We as humans are very flawed, um, and so we may, we um, make bad choices. But Jesus uh, forgives us and wants us. And He told me 
that he wants us to learn from the mistakes that we make, from the bad choices we make, so that we will stop making them. The, the, the really terrible thing about sin is not that we sin, it's that we persist in sinning. Right. I no. think that, that comes with the philosophy. Once you've decided to sin, then that's pro presumably because you don't think it's that big a deal. And if you've yeah. done, done it ten more times, then it completely gets etched in your, you know, removed from your conscience altogether that it is anything wrong with it. You know, it is said that during the wars, you know, Japan fought with China and so it's a place called Nanking. Um, the soldiers would come and then they would like split open pregnant women and kill the babies and so on. And I think I heard some of that initially the soldiers thought this was something wrong that they were doing. But after they did a few, there was no more remorse. They just did it as a matter of course. You know, they just split, split open women and they were having fun doing it. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's such a, even such a wicked thing can uh, you know, become seared in your uh, conscience. It's but you know that's th important thing because it seems to happen right now in our own culture. You know this is what this is my next question actually. Maybe I should ask you, is that when you were got, got to the other side, you were escorted into by by evil spirits into what, what might have been the outskirts of hell, right? That's what yeah. you describe. Yeah. Now and you know you live life just like ordinary people here. You know you went to work, you did that, did this, this, and all, and so on. And whatever you did, you made those choices, not, not thinking that this is a big sin that I'm about to commit. You know, you just did whatever is normally socially acceptable with, you know, for the most part. So what is the greatest sin, in your opinion, that earned you hell? I'm asking this question because it's relevant to people in society here. Because everybody is just doing what you presumably were doing, right? Well, I was an atheist, and I was opposed to God. And so I was... Um, completely alienated from God, and I promoted that idea. Um, my all of my friends who were all of my friends were basically all college professors, different fields, and my friends all agreed there was no God, and that anybody that believed in God was an idiot, stupid, ignorant, foolish. Um, we used to mock Christians. Um, we mocked people that believed in God. Um, that, that was my greatest sin because the consequence of that was um, with no respect for God, I didn't have um, any respect for what God demands of us, which is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Hmm. The, two, the two are inseparable. Yeah, that's very interesting. So uh, it looks like the greatest sin that you committed was active rebellion against the ex person existence of God. Basically, you were hostile to this is, I mean, in your limited capacity, this is all you could do to overthrow him from his throne, so to speak, right? But, yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine, I cannot, I'm not God, so I don't, I can't judge another human soul, but I can't imagine a person who um, denies God going to heaven. Why, why would um, someone who says there is no God go to heaven, you know? I mean, you know, the, the argument always is, well, they're a good person. No, they aren't a good person. Um, they only think they're good. They live in the self-delusion of their goodness, which they which they have defined their goodness. Like, well, I, you know, I don't I don't uh, kill babies, you know, or whatever. That 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 doesn't make you good. I mean, you've got to do a whole lot more than not kill babies to be a good person. Yeah. You know. All right. So, yeah, um, I was about to say I just lost my train of thought. Um. Yeah, right. So I guess the sin that you committed was that you were hostile and opposed uh, opposed to God, and that was enough for you to earn hell, basically. Yes. So, yeah. But the modern day, the confusion is not so much about hostility towards God. Maybe people who really turn their fist against God, we can make a case that, yeah, well, yeah, well, they are so rebellious against God, if they had any more powers, they would try and, you know, assassinate him if, if they could, right? Um, but, but that's not where the culture is. At least in America, people seem to go to church. Um, they're roughly divided as liberals and conservatives, not to bring up you know, division here. But the, the, what divides them is actually a theological uh, point that, that, that they hold towards the nature of God. What they think God expects of them to do is, like you said, love your neighbors and so on. What that means is love. That's why you know everybody is walking around. The liberals have signs saying love, the Unitarian Church and all the the signs are all about love and gay marriage and 
uh, love towards your uh, the immigrants and the refugees and all sorts of things that's a kind of love um it is true it is love uh, to care for another person is a very important thing and it doesn't come naturally to me so it, i understand the value of it you know as soon as i engage with the person immediately i notice how annoying and, and manipulative they are and then that make, makes it difficult for me to associate with the person i have all the great respect for you know people who want to do this you know take an active interest in other people and you know love them in a way so that is that's that's what god expects of it that's the number one thing that god wants of people but then there's the conservatives on the other side and uh, um they you know bring out the problem you know the the the, the, the theological aspects of sin and you know the the sinful nature of people and all the wickedness that you know large government can create all these problems and they see the sin aspect they their focus is on the sin and the destruction that evil that human beings are capable of uh so when you said that the, the the greatest thing that you did was rebellion against god most of us are not in that category at least you know the church going conservatives and liberals they're not in that category that uh, we are all actively rebelling against god. nobody things like that so then uh, my question is does this count as both you know valid forms of uh, christianity you know just the fact that we all go to church but we don't agree on very, very much anything else is is just the you know is this is this grounds for earning hell uh, if on either side either p- kind of behavior i would like to with to think you know yeah i hope you understand my motivation behind this question right yeah, yeah. um i think that rational people um can have different points of view on how to um create a um heaven on earth that's what we pray for that will be done on earth as it is in heaven how can we create heaven on earth rational people can disagree about what that might look like and how we can achieve it but it is not rational to ignore social justice that is not rational um i can give you a thousand examples i'll give you one example poor people um typically have no no zero non legal representation when they go to court they don't they don't get um a defense attorney at all they're just thrown into the uh justice system and many many people are innocent people are in prison many uh people are uh in prison for long periods of time um for uh things that um they was only a minor offense like for example uh, the possession of a small amount of marijuana and they end up serving 30 years in prison or life sentences and stuff like that I mean just crazy stuff rich people um because they can afford good legal representation very often get away with all kinds of crimes um it's very common in our justice system our our justice system needs a lot of work um the solutions to society's problems is to not put several million people in prison like what we have today the united states of have america has more people in prison than any country in the world including china including russia we have more people in prison than any other country by a huge amount our justice system is um not just i mean that's one thing that rational people could work on and make the justice system a better system uh but instead people um you know want to want to argue and um just get all emotional and call each other names and not work towards a common solution of a more just society like for um you know go i mean this this hundreds and hundreds of examples of things in our society that need to be made better um i think we do a pretty good job with our highway system um you know uh, you know that of course there's some potholes and some bad bridges here and there but where i live which is in the middle of america um the the highways are pretty good that we have one really terrible bridge that needs to be fixed and hopefully that'll happen but you know the, rational people can resolve these things it's not insoluble 
Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, you know, even in atheistic uh, countries that have since veered away from Christianity or Protestant heritage, you know, Netherlands and so on, you know, they can sit there and argue about all these things too, whether bridges need to be fixed, the justice system needs to be fixed, all this stuff they can they can also argue without bringing the Bible or morality or anything of in, into the picture. What I'm yeah. talking about is Christians, America at least, you know, for the most part, people seem to be religious. And, you know, they go to church, they profess their faith in Jesus. And, you know, you have to give them the benefit of doubt that they are, you know, trying in earnest to earn their salvation. Um, but like I was describing, the liberals and the conservatives, the liberals, you know, they think all that is needed is for you to have genuine love for people and all the problems will resolve themselves. And God could care about care less about everything else. All he cares about is how you treated other people. And so it is on the other. No, no, no. God creates a God can, cares a lot about sin, you know, and the breaking away from the norms of the Bible. And uh, and if you take the sin problem lightly, you're going to end up with enormous problems. You know, actually, communism. You can argue that it is a liberal philosophy. It's just that they eliminated God because they didn't see how it was relevant to getting anything done. So they got got God out of it. And the state became more powerful, and you know, look at all the enormous damage that you know the number of the, the, the lives have been lost. Some hundred million lives have been lost to communism by conservative accounting in in the last century. And this all happened with the you know, like they said, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, so this is this is this is what divides the two people. And I'm asking, I guess, the point of what I was trying to ask was, since you found yourself in hell. Because you are actively rebellious against God, but in our culture we are not actively rebellious against God. Yet, uh, the two sides find you know irreconcilable differences. Even at, at some level, that cuts through the theological line. And I'm wondering if any of this threads on sin, y if any of this is, in your opinion, is serious enough that we should take into consideration. Because it's good on us hell. It's not enough to just go along and think everything is going to work out if you you know say you love your neighbor and put some sign outside welcoming refugees you're going to get to heaven is that and you understand what i'm saying yeah but i um you you give the, the example of um communism uh for example um joseph stalin and mao Zedong, the two greatest representatives of uh, communism were both atheists um they tried to eliminate all religion from the country, and they're both responsible for the deaths of tens of millions, knowing, I mean, willful, knowing deaths of ten millions of their own citizens. Um, you know, a pretty extreme example, and I don't think they represent communism. I think they represent uh, evil. I think they represent authoritarian rule. Um, you know, to equate them with liberalism, I think, is um, not a very sound argument. But anyways... Um, one of the greatest things that happened in the history of our country was the tradition of war has always been to the victor go the spoils. And at the end of World War II, George C. Marshall, who was a general, he was a warrior, convinced Truman and convinced the Congress that what we needed to do was to rebuild Japan and Germany, our enemies. And we spent um, hundreds of millions of dollars rebuilding those countries. Never been done, in, in, in my understanding, that has never been done in the history of the world. The history of the world was always, to the victor goes the spoils. Mm -hmm. And instead, we rebuilt those two countries. Now, um, with the, there's a couple of motivations. One is I could say, you know, People like Truman and Marshall and the Congress and the American people, because they were Christians, thought that that was the better way to treat their enemy, because the Bible says, love your enemy. That would be one motivation. Another motivation was it would be um, enlightened self-interest, because um, everyone understood that the reason why Germany uh, went to Hitler because of what the um, Allies did to Germany after World War I. They bankrupted and they put in such onerous um, burdens on Germany that Germany was never economically able to recover. So enlightened self-interest said, instead of squashing your enemy and keep stepping on them, why don't we try and bring them back into the world economically? And so, um, but you know what? There's, there's not a uh, opposition between love and enlightened self-interest because you know, on, the bottom line is is that if I am good to you, 
there's a much higher probability that you're going to reciprocate my goodness with your goodness back to me. Now, there is a small possibility that I might be good to you and you might take advantage of and try and scam me or rob me or something like that. But, um, you know, that's the exception. That Generally, my experience has been that love creates a loving response back. And that's what, and once again, I'm, I'm going back to, that's what Jesus, I didn't, Jesus and I didn't talk about the Marshall Plan, but Jesus and I did. He said that if you love people, they will respond back to you with love. And that has been my experience for over 30 years. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's generally true. And we don't want to get sidetracked into that, but I, you know, nobody in the world actually um, is against loving us. If, if loving one another nobody says that well love is such a bad idea that you should do as little of it as possible the problem yeah. is it's more complicated than that when you start loving somebody i actually you know i mentioned earlier that uh, pro family problems in india you know i don't know if you know the eastern culture is actually they understand love at more of the level than the western culture the reason is people get into each other's lives much deeper than they get into each other's lives here in the West. And the problem, it creates all sorts of problems in the process too. It is good in a way because, you know, people feel connected, they feel assured, and, you know, they, they can count on each other and so on. But on the other hand, they become manipulative. The sin comes in, uh, it came, comes to the surface. Then they'll try to pitch two people against each other. Who are you loving more? Him or him or more. Oh, last last yeah. time I went to India, I had to, it was a fight, and then my, it was basically it came down to my dad saying, no, you should not go visit these other people. We're all going to go visit yeah. this family. But during the day, something came up and they broke into a fight and he said, he's not coming. <laughs> you know, it's all based in jealousy. So love and jealousy, two sides of the same coin. So uh, that, that's, you know, that's an aside. So, yeah, that, uh, yeah, but it's not, it's not loving to try and con control other people. Right. That's not love. Yeah. That's domination. Yeah. You know, that, but uh, I, um, Today is my birthday. Yes, happy birthday, Albert. Thank you. And um, I, my uh, son-in-law is coming to pick me up in a few minutes to take me up to dinner. So Okay, that sounds good. So, I mean, this, this is a good place to stop. And I just want to say one more thing. Just take one minute, yeah. and then we can probably do this again. We've covered a lot of things. So, Albert, um, uh, I heard you you published one more book called Lessons Learned. Is that correct? No, no, I've got a new one. It's called Befriend God, Life with Jesus. Oh, okay, yeah. Before so I've got four life. books. Okay. So I'll put up the names of your books online so people can see this. The other yeah. thing I was about to ask you was, you know, you mean your fame, I mentioned your name is famous, a lot of people are looking this stuff and so on. I don't know if this has actually translated to income by any means. I think you may have, your income. No, it's, that's, it's not working for me at all. Uh, it's what? Not working. <laughs> I'm getting poorer and poorer. <laughs> right, right. So that was the other thing I was going to mention is maybe with your permission, I can... Uh, put a link to your church or something that, you know, people watch this stuff. If you're, they're blessed by it, they're learning stuff from it, maybe they can make a donation um, to your church and ministry. Um, I but, personally would but, like to come down and visit to more than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, Albert, that sounds good. If you can maybe text me some information, I'll put your links to your books and uh, the address to how to send a donation also in this video. Uh, okay. Yeah, look at my new uh, website. I've just redone my website and it's um, much better than it used to be yeah and it just have all that information on it right does it have a way to like donate on that website if not we can maybe set something up at some point no it doesn't no okay yeah we can we can look into setting something up like that i'm not very good at making money <laughs> <laughs> yeah like you said you know money is important to a point and after that yeah. there's a lot of diminishing returns you know okay yeah. Sounds good. So happy birthday, Howard. Uh, thank you for another thank interview. You. Do you think there's more that we will get to cover in another episode if you set another one like this? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Sounds good. <laughs> no, I don't have challenging questions for you, so okay. hopefully it'll get interesting. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Okay. God bless you. Yeah. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye-bye.